atmosphere, uh, uh, climate physics, and ocean uh, wave wave dynamics. I don't know whether Shankar can tell us whether he was triggered by our own experience of the tsunami from uh, what was it, 2004, and uh, uh, and uh, he has uh, he has done. Uh, work on climate physics and uh, especially on ocean waves as well as on glaciology. So he was, he's uh, he's been uh, studying the glaciers of the Himalayas as well, of late. And so he's a very appropriate person. We thought uh, uh, to uh, tell us about uh, uh, climate physics, which of course is a very topical uh, subject right now, and uh, also uh, uh, two of the Nobel prizes this year has gone to climate physics to actually recognize also the importance of this very significant uh, area. Uh, so um, just to tell you a bit more about uh, Shankar, he obtained his MS from IIT Delhi in 1979, his PhD from TFR Mumbai in 1987. As a postdoctoral fellow at IMSC, later at IIT Kanpur, he joined IMSC Chennai as a faculty in 1991, uh, where he is currently an honorary professor. Uh, he has won the prestigious uh, Professor Y.T. Tathachari uh, Research Award for Science in 2008. Professor Ashankar, we're very happy you agreed to join us today. So please, we look forward to hearing from you on climate physics. Yeah. Thank you, Arul, for uh, the introduction and for inviting me. Uh, actually, maybe I should clarify, I have not really worked on climate science glaciers and climate but there the issue is more how the climate influences a glacier and not climate per se not the climate per se. but mm -hmm. but because of that i've been an interested spectator in uh, uh, climate and climate science so your it's really the po uh, point of view an outsider that you're outside spectator that you're going to uh, get now um so is my screen on yeah 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 okay so this is uh, the broad, uh, first I'll describe this time's physics Nobel Prizes. And uh, then <clears throat> sort of the history of climate physics and some words about the current situation. So as you, uh, we know the this prize has gone to Manabe, Hasselman and Parisi uh, for groundbreaking contributions of uh, complex systems. So now one interesting thing here is neither Manabe nor Hasselman are affiliated to physics departments. Manabe is an atmospheric physics person basically and Hasselman is an oceanographer. So this prize uh, recognizes the work that you know physics is not done only in physics departments uh, but, uh, but uh, so in, in during the press conference that uh, when this prize was announced, one of the questions asked by a journalist was the what you see on the screen here. What is the message that the Nobel Prize wants, uh, Nobel Committee wants to send to the world leaders? So, um, uh, so basic answer is uh, these are the answers of the three uh, members that that were there that. Uh, it's a physics prize, and so uh, you're, they're trying to make the point that the climate modeling and climate uh, science is uh, is solid real science. And the other point is that uh, when you're studying a complex system like the climate, then you need specific models. You also need an overall conceptual understanding. And Parisi uh, comes in that way. His contribution was uh, about very general disordered uh, and complex systems. So uh, emergent behavior in these. So that's why that is the, the sort of link between the three prizes that. Uh, so Parisi for general understanding of uh, the issues of complex disordered systems and Manabe Hasselman for a particular complex system, that is the Earth's climate. Um, so just one, uh, maybe this audience doesn't need it, but just the um, 
emer I mean, why, what is this emergent phenomena? Uh, actually, it's a very old concept. Something like sound, uh, one would call it an emergent phenomena because it is a result of very complicated motion of the air molecules uh, that uh, that are there. But um, once you realize that uh, there's an emergent phenomena called sound, that is a wave, then after that, you don't have to uh, know all the details of the uh, you know dynamics of the uh, air in which the sound propagates. Same is true for waves, any water wave uh, and so on. But the point is that once you understand an, uh, uh, this emergent phenomena or emergent uh, concept, then you can just take it from there and go ahead. So in all complex systems, these are uh, very important concepts to uh, realize. Anyway, this is the Earth system. Um, as we are taught in school, there's the atmosphere, which is a thin layer of air surrounding the Earth. The biosphere, which is all life on Earth, mainly plants. The cryosphere, all the ice on Earth, mainly in the poles. Uh, the land surface and the hydrosphere, which actually uh, mainly the oceans, which cover most of the uh, surface of the Earth. And everything is powered by the sun. The basic source of energy is the sun. Now, we separate these in our heads uh, for convenience, but they're all interacting with each other. And uh, it is one uh, big system. Each of these are in themselves are complex systems. And all of them, but the net interaction of all of this uh, is what we see around us. Uh, so let's see how it started. Uh, actually, the story starts in 1824 by Fourier. As you know, Fourier was one of the pioneers in the theory of heat. So he, uh, the heat equation, Fourier's law for conduction, etc. And uh, he asked this question, uh, he wrote this paper, the general remarks on the temperature of terrestrial globe and planetary spaces. So what he was asking was, what sets the Earth's temperature? Uh, as you know, it's roughly about 15 degrees centigrade, the average global temperature. Why is it 15 degrees centigrade? Why is it not 100? Why is it not minus 60? What, what, what sets it? So he, of course, didn't have all the uh, physics necessary to give a complete answer. But uh, let me give it uh, the uh, broad picture first that... Uh, uh, what basically sets the uh, Earth's temperature is energy balance. Uh, energy is getting absorbed from the sun, and that heat warms up the Earth. As you know, all warm bodies radiate energy, so the uh, Earth in turn radiates out energy. The hotter it becomes, the more energy it radiates. At sometimes there's a balance between the energy coming in and the energy going out, and that. Uh, at, that's the uh, temperature at which which is stable. So as I said, he didn't know all this, but he, may, I mean, uh, one of the things he asked in this paper is how does the atmosphere affect the global temperature? So he, uh, as I says, uh, he didn't have the theory to do it, but he just went by an experiment, which is these hot boxes where you, uh, if you make a hot box with glass and all, the uh, lowest container will be the hottest and then it will cool down as you go up. So sort of based on this, he basically made an inspired guess. Uh, I mean, based on this and the fact that there's a, you know, the um, uh, it cools up even in the atmosphere as you go higher. Hill stations are cooler than the plains and so on. So uh, essentially he made an inspired guess that the atmosphere, for some reason, behaves like glass. It lets in light, but blocks up uh, the outgoing heat. And so it warms up the Earth, and so that the temperature of the Earth would be 
higher than if uh, if there were no atmosphere and that is the what now nowadays we call the greenhouse effect uh, next one major step was why does the atmosphere behave like glass so what component of the atmosphere makes it behave like glass so this was answered by tyndall who's actually a condensed matter experimentalist who did a series of experiments on absorption properties of all the gases uh, that constitute the uh, atmosphere and uh, his um, uh, conclusion here uh, was and you as you can see he was motivated by fourier's work uh, so he says chief in influence be excised by aqueous vapor which is uh, water vapor and carbonic acid which is the old fashioned name for carbon dioxide and uh, uh, hydrocarbons uh, like methane so these were identified so what we call today the uh, these are the primary greenhouse gases and uh, uh, and of course even at that time they realized that uh, all this effect is going to uh, i mean any changes in these concentration of the greenhouse gases is going to produce changes of climate so then after that the very i mean um, thermal radiation got understood so tyndall was 1960 and from then till the end of the century firstly after maxwell's equations it was realized that thermal radiation is nothing but electromagnetic waves then laws of radiation uh, which uh, provide which make it possible to do quantitative calculations the stefan boltzmann law and then uh, 1989 end of the century was the wines uh, displacement law uh, ultimately leading to the planck's formula so as soon as these things came in one really brilliant paper uh, arrhenius uh, quantified the greenhouse effect so he uh, the title let me read it out if you can't uh, see it on the influence of carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature on the ground and by the way at that time there was his motivation was not uh, human induced global warming etc that was not uh, around at that time uh, like what you can his motivation he gives here i should certainly not have undertaken these tedious calculations had it not been for the fact that uh, we want to understand ice ages so there was geomorphological evidence that large portions of the uh, northern hemisphere had been covered by ice long ago so it was clear to them that there must have been quite a very different climate long ago so that was a climate change the natural climate change that uh, motivated these people to do this work and uh, his conclusion finally was so this is just uh, the table is just to show what he meant by tedious calculations all these things you would have had to do by hand um but his final conclusion was remarkable and the data analysis in this paper is also really remarkable uh that he says that if the carbon dioxide uh, i mean firstly that the temperature is kind of strongly controlled by the concentration of co2 in the atmosphere secondly if the uh, concentration doubles then the temperature will increase by about 5 to 6 degrees centigrade now modern um, uh, estimates based on better data etc put this more like 2.5 to 4 degrees centigrade but this logarithmic dependence on the concentration of greenhouse gases co2 in particular is uh, holds true till today and that uh, so by the end of the 19th century um it was known that greenhouse i mean the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere strongly control the earth's temperature and some quantitative uh, aspect was also known that if the concentration doubles then the temperature will increase by about 5 6 degrees at least that was what was thought at that time the first person to worry about human activities to my knowledge is uh, this uh, paper a, a classic paper by a british engineer called calendar 
so he estimated how much uh, you know as i said by fuel consumption how much man has added carbon dioxide has added uh, has added to the atmosphere and then knowing i mean from the work of uh, fourier uh, and arrhenius etc he estimated that this should cause an uh, warming uh, of the temperature and he looked at whatever data was possible uh, that he had at that time and concluded that indeed uh, uh, it, the there is a warming uh, 5 degrees so 0.5 degrees per century Uh, so you can see actually one of the data uh, stations was uh, Allahabad uh, over here. So then, other question is: Is the CO two actually increasing? Because yes, uh, humans are emitting a lot of CO two into the atmosphere by burning fuel, burning etc. But it may be getting absorbed by the ocean, absorbed by various other places. Is actually the concentration increasing? this answer was addressed by keeling again this is a really classic paper in the field is carbon dioxide from fossil fuel changing man's environment he made the, so this graph represents 10 years of work so in a, a lab in uh, hawaii moanalo lab uh, he made very careful uh, co2 measurements so the, you can see this is from 1958 to 1968 10 years of data and uh, there was a i mean there's a clear trend increasing trend in this so he concluded that yes actually the co2 concentration in the atmosphere is increasing despite whatever is getting absorbed in uh, other places so by the way this lab has continued these measurements from um, uh, keeling's time and this is now called the keeling curve and as you can see from 1960 onwards there has been a steady increase so uh, this is 320 parts per million and in the past from all paleoclimate studies uh, the co2 has never been more than around 300 parts per million and then now uh, today it is 420 parts per million and you can see there's no no uh, sign of it flattening or uh, decreasing it's just uh, increasing year by year So then, in the '60s, large number of Shankar, sorry, Shankar, just a quick clarification. What is that rapid oscillation and the smooth curve? Ah, uh, that's the uh, summer winter effect. Oh. So basically, okay. uh, the northern hemisphere has more plants than the southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So in the summer of uh, the northern hemisphere, more CO2 gets absorbed and there's a dip. Winter of the northern hemisphere. Uh, there's a there's a peak, okay. so that's that's the uh, oscillation, the summer winter okay. oscillation. That uh, all right, thanks. Um, so in the '60s, models started getting developed, and uh, also you can you know that was the time computers came around. So even the simplest of models over here require computers, and, and uh, not much can be done analytically. Um, so there were all types of uh, levels of models uh, discovered simple ones which uh, what uh, uh, which look at only gross quantities like say average temperature total ice cover and so on uh, so finite number of degrees of freedom so what we would call zero dimensional models um, then more detailed models uh, either one dimension which is just taking the z axis into account averaging over uh, la longitude latitude and full three dimensional uh, models so these are called global uh, climate or global circulation models gcms uh, so this would give you detailed information about the whole globe uh, full uh, this thing now um, let me i mean um, just make a remark over here uh, like everywhere extremely complicated model is difficult to understand it's like a black box you put in something you get out something now how do you get it where where do you get it etc so there's 
um, there was one very nice paper written by uh, atmosphere. I mean, uh, he is a climate scientist held, and this is recognized by the IPCC also. Like, with, uh, let me read out this thing. With the development of computer capacities, simpler models have not disappeared. On the contrary, stronger emphasis has been given to the hierarchy of models as the only way to provide linkage between theoretical understanding and the complexity of realistic models. We are used to this in physics. We have effective models at all scales. And it is accepted that you need uh, understanding of different aspects at different scales to get a holistic understanding of the problem. So consequently, uh, making models, even uh, the detailed global uh, circulation models, is not so easy. It's not just that you set up Navier-Stokes uh, numerical uh, solution or Navier-Stokes equation. There are many complicated processes going on, and it requires an understanding of th these processes at different scales in order to build, uh, build such models. And th there was uh, that is uh, Manabe's uh, contribution. So these are uh, four of these uh, uh, his well-known papers. Um, uh, so there's a, in the Nobel site, there's a document called Scientific Background. So I got these references from there. Uh, so you can see initially the papers are on uh, understanding various processes in the atmosphere. And uh, this one, I think, is a one-dimensional model that is just looking at the uh, vertical variation, the variation of things with respect to elevation. Uh, these two are, I think, on GCMs. Um, where So this you can see 74. Uh, so 60s to 70s, he made major contributions in development of uh, uh, the GCM. And uh, this particular one I boxed because it is uh, it's a classic. Um, so, in fact, there is uh, some uh, site over here where, where they uh, looked at a survey. So, what do you consider to be the most three most influential papers? So, this was asked of all the lead authors of the IPCC report. And the clear winner was uh, this Manabe Weatherland paper uh, that I've boxed over there. But I would should stress that they are not the only people who contributed to GCM. There were many groups uh, working on them. And, um, you know, again, uh, just uh, aside, um, you know, the way we generate scientific knowledge itself is a pretty complex system. Large number of interacting uh, scientists. And as time goes on, the number is increasing. The level of interaction between them is increasing. So is whatever the knowledge emerges from this complex uh, system. And probably as time goes by, individual contributions will be uh, proportionally less uh, significant than uh, earlier. Um, anyway, so after this uh, development of G uh, GCMs, let me, I mean, uh, initially there were two, I mean, there were the, the atmosphere and the ocean were developed, uh, were modeled independently. So the, the atmospheric circulation models, the AGCM, and the ocean circulation models, the OGCM. Uh, and uh, the effect of atmosphere in the ocean model would just be as boundary condition and vice versa. So there was no dynamic interaction uh, between these. Then slowly they were integrated so that uh, the full couple dynamics was uh, simulated. So AOGCMs, atmospheric and ocean uh, global circulation models. And the cryosphere was also uh, a, part of, a part of these models. Then after 2000 started this, uh, what people now call Earth system models, which also incorporate uh, uh, what you call uh, carbon cycle and influence of the biosphere uh, uh, into these models. They treat them also as part of the dynamics, not as simply as boundary conditions. So you see, these uh, models, they uh, 
at the core, they have a solver for the Navier-Stokes equations for the entire atmosphere and ocean. But then after that, there's a huge number of processes going on. For example, clouds, when will they start raining, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so all so there's a big physics package, uh, 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 which goes into which incorporates all these uh, processes. And that's really the complicated part of uh, these models. So now, uh, 2000 onwards, this whole system is being simulated, but f not perfect because, uh, uh, as I said, there are a huge number of processes which are uh, incorporated into these models, and none of them are fully understood. In fact, uh, the cloud physics is a apparently is still a pretty open uh, problem, how to incorporate it, and uh, so on. So that's how the uh, models went. But now, uh, how do you interpret outputs of these models? Uh, I mean, of course, you, can, you just, you get a big temperature field and uh, um, pressure field, water moisture field, relative humidity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, how do you understand them? How do you, uh, what do you call it, infer? Uh, uh, how do you make inferences from this model output? And it's also a very noisy system. So this is the uh, part uh, in which uh, Hasselman's uh, uh, contribution was uh, very important. So uh, he basically first, in, I mean, uh, so in these two papers, he looks at noise in uh, in climate variables. So sea surface temperature, for example, is a climate variable. Atmospheric temperature would be one. And then uh, after that, based on this, he went on to this problem of getting signals uh, from the uh, extracting signals from models and data. So um, just to give you what you mean by fluctuation, this is the global uh, temperature uh, measured by various uh, agencies. And you can see while there could be a trend, there's a lot of fluctuations. And uh, uh, global average temperature, as you know, will have less fluctuations. When you look at local temperatures and the temperature field, there are really huge amount of fluctuations. Uh, there's also because day-to-day -day variation, etc. But even the annual, I mean, if you take daily means, the, there are uh, intrinsic climate noise. So this was uh, the way Hasselman uh, analyzed it. That, uh, so by the way, climate is defined as average weather over decadal time scales, uh, 10 years or maybe five years, uh, take it as you wish, but long-term averages of uh, weather variables is uh, what we call climate. So consequently, the fluctuations in climate is determined by fluctuations of the weather. And Hasselman analyzed it uh, in this way. Like you, you can see that uh, the, there are continuous random excitations, which are weather disturbances. And then the rest of the system sort of slow, uh, uh, there's a slow variation, which is a climate. And there's a rapid variation, which is the weather. So his conclusion basically was that if weather is modeled by white noise, then climate has red noise, one by F squared. So same as, uh, uh, quite uh, interesting, uh, same as uh, the Brownian motion problem. That is, if the pollen grains of the Brownian motion, and if you make the analogy of them, them with climate variables, which are averaged out big, large variables, and the small atoms that are hitting these pollen grains as weather uh, causing random events, then the fluctuations of the climate variables will be exactly same as, uh, uh, statistically the same as uh, the fluctuations of these pollen grains in a Brownian motion problem. Uh, Shankar, may I interrupt for a second? Please. It's definitely 1 over F squared and not 1 over F? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Very clear. As you can see, model predicts red variance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so then, 
his next thing was um, using this uh, understanding of the noise uh, in the system to basically work on uh, signal to noise ratio improvements. I mean, this is, of course, a standard problem, electrical engineer, a lot of people do it all the time, um, you know, how best to extract uh, signals from noise. Hasselman's contribution was doing it for atmosphere and climate uh, variables. And in it, one of his main impact was uh, ways to attribute the observed climate change, uh, attribution to human um, uh, activities. So you can see in the introduction, so this is uh, fingerprinting is the method they call it. These are ways to uh, filter out and enhance, optimally enhance the signal to noise uh, ratios. But you can see the motivation is that a clear in identification of anthropogenic signal in climate observations uh, is important. And uh, that was the main um, motivation of uh, this work. And as he says here, the, uh, again, part of the introduction, uh, there are three main issues. One is, of course, what do you want to study? Then second is you need to know the noise, what type of noise those variables have. That he had done earlier. And then this part of his work was building on this knowledge in order to uh, get uh, what you call it, develop methods for optimal signal to noise uh, ratio, which they call fingerprinting. I don't know why it's called fingerprinting, but that's what they call it. Now, the, the, in uh, the excerpt from that document called Scientific Background in the Nobel Prize website, uh, he says this paper was a uh, sort of initiated a large amount of work and provided strong scientific support for the conclusion reached by IPCC. I think this should read 2007, as we'll see just now. Uh, uh, so just to illustrate this last uh, sentence, let me give you excerpts from the IPCC reports. Uh, so by the way, just for uh, the IPCC was set up is the um, Intergovernmental Planet for Climate Change, IPCC. It was set up, it's a UN organization set up by the World Meteorological Organization in 1988. That's the time people realized that global warming was a serious problem. And uh, the IPCC was set up to uh, basically alert the world about it. Uh, it does not do any research itself, so it makes assessment reports. So basically it reviews all the literature, published literature uh, in climate science, which is of course huge amount, and produces reports on different aspects of it. So in all the reports, they have a summary, which is called uh, SPM, Summary for Policymakers, um, where uh, so pol policymakers are governments and in principle citizens. So they try to just summarize uh, findings over there. So the first assessment report they produced called FAR was in 1990. Uh, and you can say that uh, they are sort of saying, okay, there is warming, but the unequ unequivocal detection of enhanced greenhouse effects from observations is not likely for a decade or more. So basically they, there's too much noise and uh, for them to very clearly say that uh, this, whatever warming is seen is due to uh, human um, activity. Second report, the SAR, SAR, was a second assessment report, 1995. Um, here also, they are not very clear. So, however, to date, it has not been possible to firmly establish a clear connection between these regional changes and human activities. Then the third assessment report, TAR, was in 2001. Uh, there, there are a bit more sure, but still a vague statement uh, that, of course, it has changed and a sort of weak statement with saying some of these changes are attributed, attributable to human activities. Then came the fourth one and they said, oh, shit, it's far again. So they changed the nomenclature to a uh, more sustainable thing and called AR4. 
after that it is ar4 ar5 but you can see the language difference over here in the summary uh, it is very confident it is, i mean and saying the understanding is leading to very high confidence that uh, net average of human activities has been one of warming and this very high confidence is defined actually very high confidence represents 90% confidence limit so clearly these uh, this statement is based on solid statistical analysis and that uh, is due to uh, i mean due to meaning uh, a huge contributor towards uh, doing that was uh, hasselman uh, the who initiated the line of work that led to this uh, thing so by the way you can see uh, his paper first paper was produced um, published in 1993 this is about 14 years it has taken uh, for it for other people to start working on it for it to get accepted and as you know that's a typical time scale for a new idea to come in get accepted and people have to get familiar with it and then start using it uh, so after that you can see the ar5 sorry this should be 2013 uh ar6 which uh, came out this year uh, the statement i mean let this fast one it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere ocean land widespread changes blah 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 so now after the uh, last uh, two decades or so there basically no doubt about uh, this uh, business of attributing the change to human activities so now what is the situation just some remarks uh, so just to give a sort of rough uh, way to think at least the way i think about it um see the earth the climate is always changing uh the earth uh, was never in thermodynamic equilibrium and will never will be so there have been ups and downs which are called the glacial cycles uh at time scales of uh, 10000 100000 years um and they've been going on for a long time in the past uh the, the main force uh, external force thing of the climate is the input of solar energy which uh periodically varies uh due to periodic variations in the earth's orbit and orientation of the orbit so these are called the milankovitch cycles i think i have yes so these are the milankovitch cycles uh so there are uh, three different uh, the, um, cycles one is 26000 40000 and 100000 years now the response is very non linear uh, and uh, what do you call uh, stochastic i mean it's a, because of the complexity response is also not constant in time because the earth system is changing the uh, earth surface today and what it was long time i mean say uh 1 billion years ago is very different and uh, so on so all uh, what, uh, i mean um, what we've seen so far i mean what i've sort of seen meaning just described so far is that this work of uh, these climate scientists have sort of um, very clearly says that human activities have accelerated this rate of warming you see like in these glacial cycles the spread is about 10 degrees centigrade so 10 degrees in 100000 years or 10 degrees in 10 1 degree in 1000 years last century the warming rate has been 1 degree in 100 years so 10 times faster so that's really the problem and that is uh, what has caused uh, uh, this thing so yes these are the uh, variations of the the thing and this is the response of the earth uh, uh, paleo climate data i won't go into how it comes so this is the temperature going up and down this is the co2 going up and down and then a sudden rise over here uh, which is in the end uh, again at a scale of 10000 years it's like a sudden spike of uh, co2 being put into the uh, atmosphere so now what is overall known about uh, how to stabilize so it's very well established that the climate will stabilize only if the concentration of the greenhouse gases 
in the atmosphere stabilizers. And the concentration is largely controlled by CO2. You know, though uh, actually water vapor is the dominant uh, 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 greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. But its concentration is controlled. I mean, it's a part of the system. So it depends on, it depends very strongly on the climate itself in the sense, uh, it, what do you call it, uh, how much evaporates from the ocean and uh, so on and so forth. So it's also uh, well agreed now that the key control is the external forcing of anthropogenic CO2. Uh, the uh, key control for this accelerated rate of uh, warming uh, over the natural rate is this uh, anthropogenic CO2. So the climate will stabilize only if the, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, if the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere stabilizes, which means that the human emissions have to be only that much that can be uh, stabilized by the earth, I mean, absorbed by the earth. So this is what nowadays people call the net zero condition. That is, you emit net zero. You emit only as much as is absorbed. Consequently, the concentration of the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere doesn't uh, increase. It's and consequently climate stabilizes. So the temperature at which the climate will stabilize depends on the concentration of the greenhouse gases in, at which it will stabilize. Now, um, yeah, how to achieve this net zero? Not very clear to me. It's again, it's getting discussed all over the world, and probably this uh, this uh, latest meeting, COPS uh, uh, climate meeting in Glasgow, has just started yesterday. There's going to be a lot of talk. Uh, one thing, of course, reducing consumption, reducing emission level is crucial. But uh, I, what is still not very clear to me is that is some amount of bioengineering, I mean, uh, what they call um, global engineering uh, required. That is significant amount of reforestation or other uh, ways to extract CO2 from the, artificially extract CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, so are these geoengineering uh, requ required or not is uh, not very clear to me. Um, I'll ha uh, I mean, so for example, uh, there's a con statement in the latest one, which talks about this uh, CDR. Uh, but it's what I mean. So it's good if it can be done without. I mean, they also warn about other environment uh, effects of uh, these methods. Um, so is it necessary or not? I'm still not very clear about, but it is very much in the air. So now all said and done. The, this is the rough level, the, uh, I mean, 460, 450 uh, parts per million, where the uh, CO2 concentration has to stabilize in order to, to reach this two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. Uh, this is the current uh, curve, Keeling curve, which I showed earlier. So this is IPCC, the, then these are some of the major conferences uh, that have been held. One of them is going on just now. But despite all this, this is just increasing. So will it keep going like this and go off somewhere here? Or will it sort of level off uh, over here? That's the sort of key question now. Or will it level off at some higher level? Or will it not level off at all? It's sort of an open uh, uh, question right now. Um, so uh, these are some remarks in yesterday's conference. So they agree the UN thing, the emissions continue to rise. Uh, so this NDC is this nationally determined contributions where various countries after the Paris Agreement uh, agreed to curtail their uh, emissions and reduce it. But they are saying that, okay, it may, you'll see effects after 2030. So let us see. Um, I mean, I think a clear path to solution exists, there's no doubt. But uh, will that path be taken is the big question just now.
So I think I'll stop uh, here now. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Shankar. Uh, may I you? taking us all the way from Fourier to yesterday. So <laughs> fascinating, yeah. Um, so uh, let me open up for questions. No, can I ask a question? Uh, yes, Arun? please, brother. Shankar, is there any uh, evidence that extreme events we are told have increased in frequency? What is driving that? If at all, it's true. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the, um, in general, as the climate warm, I mean, uh, warms up, it gets, it's supposed to get more vol volatile. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason to expect extreme events uh, to increase when the climate warms up. Mm -hmm. Now, I, uh, I'm not confident about your, this thing in the data, mm -hmm. uh, whether, uh, uh, anecdotally, we, it seems to be happening, right. but is there solid data which uh, clearly indicates the increase of extreme events? I mm -hmm. don't know. I have not read this AR6 report fully. Uh, in AR5, which was uh, 2013, there was no, um, what do you call it, uh, unambiguous data on this. Mm -hmm. But in the latest one, there may be, and I'm not sure of the answer. I have one question, Arul. Yeah, please uh, go on, MSR. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Prasenka, it's a nice presentation. Um, so I have a, a, a question about, uh, you know, recently massive plants were set up in Iceland to suck up carbon dioxide from atmosphere. Uh, and, and then, the, of course, the, the, the criticism about uh, you know the fact that such a things won't work you know s such plants should not be set up but there's nothing else other than that single plant you know initially there was a lot of enthusiasm but other countries say that this is not the way to go about you know reducing the carbon dioxide fingerprint in the atmosphere so your thoughts on that yes as I said uh, this is something I'm quite confused about yeah. Uh, this is this uh, CDR, uh, exactly. you know, uh, um, how, how to remove, uh, uh, it, it has, I mean, people warn that it has other, it may have other unexpected environmental uh, consequences. Exactly. So uh, what is not clear to me, is it necessary? Exactly. Uh, you know, is it possible that one just uh, em reduces emission enough that natural absorption of CO2 is, is equal to a, a, the uh, emission uh, or is it impossible to reduce to that level and you need um, artificial removal of co2 from the atmosphere I mean, yeah, so, really, but one, one plant in one corner of the earth and i, I don't know how it, how is it going to help but then uh, no, if it no i i think their plan is to set up more I mean, if it's, yes, definitely, if that is going to be a part of the solution, that it has to be set up in many places. But uh, this is some, thing, I mean, I'm, uh, the, the numbers over there, how much gets taken out yeah. and so on and so forth, I'm not really familiar with. Uh, yeah, thank you. As I said, I would like some discussion on these issues. Um, yeah, I was reading those reports, but basically uh, no numbers have come out, you know? Ah, it, okay. Yeah. Right, good, thank you. I think there's a question from Arvinda. Go ahead. Uh, sir, it's a, just a curious um, question. You have used um, the Gandhi photo when it comes complex versus simple. So, are you trying Gandhi photo? Gandhi, Gandhi oh, photo, oh, oh, Gandhi oh, image. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh. And so, that too in a slide where you are explaining complex versus uh, simple models. 
so i just curious to know why and uh, some no no so that was just um trying to illustrate cartoon which is the simplest model line drawing which is the next and a complicated painting which is like a 3d full gcm that was sort of the idea why gandhi simply because i admire him no other reason. okay <laughs> thank you uh are there questions question. uh may i ask one question shankar yeah please um what's the uh, prediction with regard to the next ice age is that going to be delayed because of this or is not going to happen at all is there any such long term forecast of what can happen if the carbon uh, dioxide keeps yes so yeah now uh, uh, bottom line is it's an open question and i've heard a talk where somebody uh, one pretty famous climate scientist addresses this issue there are no definite answers firstly uh, because the models don't run that much meaning uh, they will not uh, be you will not be able, i mean so these uh, ice ages glacial cycles are time periods of 10000 20000 years right. uh, scale right. whereas these models won't be reliable for more than 100 years or so uh, okay. maybe 100 200 or so uh, mm -hmm. so you can't use models to uh, find it or you have to uh, i mean detailed models you can't use but we know the polar uh, ice cap but, is melting yes so um, now it really actually depends how much the humans influence so for example suppose it um, um, after say end of the century it is stabilized at about 5 degrees uh, higher than now then uh, the, i mean uh, then it may not uh, affect very much okay. or 2 degrees i don't know 5 degrees may affect 2 degrees it's a open question unknown people are speculating and i don't have a feel for the answer mm -hmm. did uh, cvk have a question yeah yeah i have okay. sure. so shankar i just wanted to know about the regional the role of regional uh, climate uh, changes uh, that will influence uh, policies that are local and which will in turn help uh, the global situation is there enough data to tell how to go about from a regional point of view so yeah uh, the climate is regional but the emissions are global in the sense that um uh, it is sort of established that whatever co2 gets emitted in one place mixes very fast in the entire atmosphere time scale of months so that is why uh, the emission is a global problem so whatever is uh, being emitted say in us is affecting us um so you can't uh, i mean uh, uh, for, uh, so while effects of climate can be regional and can be different this uh, co2 concentration is going to mix up and become uniform uh, over pretty short time scales uh so that is why even that one lab uh, result you know that one all or result can be taken as indicative because after all that is just one point where those measurements yes, are yes. Being, but, but it can be taken as roughly indicative because of this fact that uh, co2 mixes very fast i mean we uh, I, just one more point i we hear about this urban heat islands and things like that nowadays yes and where people have clearly observed i think uh, the effects of this heat uh, trapped in urban uh, clusters so i mean there are people who talk about how to go about uh, afforestation or something like that to make this uh, uh, i mean handle this better so i was just wondering whether something like this at various uh, scales uh, will eventually uh, cascade into the global effect it should i suppose because uh, i i don't and, understand i mean and uh, of course while i said that the emission problem is global but 
uh, effects, I mean, regional um, uh, effects are definitely there. Uh, different regions may respond differently to the uh, climate change. And yes, yeah, sure, uh, um, the urban hotspots are very much uh, established phenomena that, you know, locally temperature goes up and how to decrease the waves, etc. So uh, climate is regional, variations are regional, but the driving driver that is this uh, CO2 emission is a global thing. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think uh, there's some uh, raised hands, uh, Raghu. Yeah, please go. I think you're muted. Sorry. Uh, my name is Raghu Tampro. I actually head a center of innovation at IIT Madras. I must be the only non-physicist in this room. But my interest comes because I'm actually doing a PhD in climate finance. Uh -huh. I think I've, I've, I've looked at all the documents and very thrilling talk. So it's a rightly philosophical question, Professor Shankar. Maybe unfair also. I feel that the scientists have done a fantastic job, but the finance and econ economics is completely broken. And it doesn't look uh -huh. like they are anywhere close to solving the problem from their point of view. So. From the talk you gave, I, I get a sense that scientists have said we have done our job. It's now up to financial and politicians and economists to fix it. If that is so, I'm afraid it's a very dismal ending. Uh, is there any further role for scientists here to play at all, other than geoengineering? Yeah, I don't know. And um, let me say that I quite share your pessimism uh, since, uh, uh, okay, let me just give my, my, my opinion on this. You see, all the decisions are made by the rich and powerful. They are also the people who are best uh, capable of shielding themselves against effects of climate change. So I'm pessimistic. It's not really a country versus country issue as far as I see it. It's a rich poor issue. The rich cause the warming, the poor suffer because of it. The rich are able to protect themselves and they make all the decisions. So, as you say, there's a question of economics and uh, finance and so on. And uh, I'm not very optimistic that things are going to happen very fast. Added to my despondency and my, my <laughs> the urgency of work like us, people like us. <laughs> Thank you, Raghu. Uh, Ramakrishna, I see a raised hand. Ramakrishna, you have a question? Yeah, please. Ramakrishna, okay, you're muted, I think. I can't hear you, at least. I still can't hear. Yeah, Ramakrishna, we can't hear you, uh, although you're not muted according to this. I think his mic has issue, maybe. Maybe you could type it in the chat. Uh, Maybe I move on to Ranjit. Okay, uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, Ranjit, please go on. Uh, thank you. Very interesting talk. I'm slightly confused about uh, uh, this uh, oscillation uh, in the carbon absorption level that you showed. And you said the reason for this uh, summer versus winter oscillation is like northern hemisphere has more land mass. So Hence, more uh, forest, if I heard correct, something like that. Yes. I'm slightly yes. confused because uh, 
i was uh, at taught in <laughs> school not really in advanced level that uh, maximum absorption uh, of co2 hence the emission of oxygen is from algae in the oceans so i yes. like confused about this attribution to forests no 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 it is true uh, most of the co2 absorbed is by the oceans and incidentally co consequently they are becoming more acidic uh, but the oceans are uh, oh you're saying that uh, but you see they i mean there's no summer winter effect there they absorb all the time whereas uh, uh, the the forest will not absorb during winter where they have less sun and they will absorb more in summer so it's true that the oceans are the dominant uh, source that absorbs the co2 but um, oceans don't essentially oceans don't have a summer winter effect forests do oh i see um, i had a couple of more questions if time permits i will ask again probably i will mute for now keep guys time thanks ranjit Surya? Yes, sir. So, am I Arun? Yeah. Yes, sir. So, my question was to regarding uh, regarding which is with regards to you know like uh, sir had mentioned that uh, when a CO two is emitted locally, then it quickly you know like diffuses off to like remote corners of the world. So, I want to know if there are like are these based on simulations or have there been experiments where you know, like a radioactive isotope of carbon is like. uh you know emitted into the air and has it been like captured in other remote corners of the world or things like that to you know like validate this claim that it quickly spreads across the earth or something actually i i i don't know uh i mean this seems to be a well accepted fact but i don't know the basis of uh, uh i mean i sup i mean but i would guess that diffusion rates are well easily measurable things so it must be based on um, experiments uh, but i don't know for a fact okay yes sir and, and one more small clarification so these climate models that you have mentioned so like the they are essentially to you know like uh, find out the like the co2 concentration that must be here and then like the te the temperature fields and things like that or like what are these models meant to do like i mean what what is the goal of these models oh what is the uh, what do they yeah so they uh, the, what are the variables in the model uh, so basically all the what do you call climate fields temperature field uh, field meaning local temp i mean in a gcm you uh, they be outputting the t temperature at every grid point that is every latlon or something for all time so temperature relative humidity pressure wind velocity uh, and you know all uh, maybe other variables but uh, all these things all the things that define what they call the state of, of the atmosphere which, which is what weather is so all the weather variables of hand these are the ones i can think of that temperature pressure relative humidity wind velocity okay yes sir and and one final question uh so so with regards to like reducing emissions versus uh, uh carbon capture or things like that so uh, like uh, in case of reduction of emissions feel that like uh, the 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 parties will place the blames on to each other and in a sense even though there are strict policies that might not be be able to like you know like reduce the emissions but instead carbon capture seems to be a uh, a more better and more uh, like reliable and implementable option so i just wanted to know your comment on that uh, sorry i didn't get the question carbon capture as opposed to uh, uh reducing emissions so as in like if, if... I, i according to me the best is if we reduce consumption reduce emissions okay. that's the most uh, eco friendly way of uh, you know uh, doing it uh, carbon capture and all is uh, if it's necessary it should be it'll have to be done but uh, if you want my opinion i would rather that simply we reduce uh, emissions which means reducing consumption because reducing emission means reducing consumption of energy which means general uh, consumption patterns should reduce 
ओके सर थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू सूर्य एनी फर्दर क्वेश्चन रंजित रंजित कैन यू जस्ट गिव मी अ मिनट प्लीज बिकॉज प्रोफेसर राम कृष्णा हैज टाइप्ड इन हिज क्वेश्चन सो लेट मी रीड आउट आई थिंक इट्स अ रिमार्क first a remark on the previous comment the problem is that a forest has no value unless you chop the wood down or dig a mine until we figure out a way to monetize a living growing forest we are in trouble do you have any idea how much it costs for the equipment to remove co2 given the rapid mixing you were mentioning such equipment needs to be near thermal power plants finally are we forced to go nuclear if we do not reduce consumption yeah uh actually i yeah. uh now okay let's go to the first thing uh how to monetize a living growing forest i don't know you can uh, i mean uh, so a forest i would rather not cut down because it's a ecosystem in itself but suppose one has a plantation of trees uh, then uh, the time it is taking out carbon from the atmosphere is when it is growing because all that carbon is becoming wood so according to me when you have uh, plantations of trees cut them down use them for paper do anything but don't burn it you know so the, as long as you don't burn it it's going to be okay as a carbon sink uh, how to monetize i do, i really don't know uh, no answer and yet yeah, by the way this again this costs of uh, the cdrs etc i would like discussion on that the cdrs is something i don't know much about uh this cdr meaning uh, carbon dioxide removal so artificial methods to uh, suck out uh, co2 from the atmosphere are they necessary how much can they take out what do they cost i have no clue about these things uh, um are we forced to go new why nuclear why not solar wind i mean those are also non fossil fuel is the key so nuclear is surely one of them um but also solar wind anything that uh... right well thank you very much shankar i think we are pretty much into uh, i think we are out of time so oh. Ranjit, do you, uh, do you have a, can I can I have a uh, ask a question? Sirike, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it goes go back on. to that uh, Keeling curve, uh, which is up to 2020. The oscillations that you showed, uh, there's no change in the uh, well. If you take the envelope, it, there's no change in the oscillations. In the amplitude of the huh. so i mean that's a little uh, puzzling if if there are changes taking place on earth in terms of uh, emissions and uh, not absorbed sufficiently how come the envelope remains the same the uh, sorry what uh, you mean no what do you mean by envelope the, the, i mean if i were to draw the uh, no. curve, i mean uh, draw the i mean join the peaks and the uh, uh, positive and negative peaks about the mean ha huh. uh, that more or less remains the same right i mean on the keeling curve so basically the amplitude of the oscillations are not changing yeah yeah so how come uh, uh, so i have uh, okay i have uh, at the outset i don't know but uh, i have been long wanting to look at these oscillations i have not never got down to it because oh. they are the difference between the summer absorption and the winter absorption right uh, 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 that is what is causing those oscillations right right so, and that, those amplitudes as you point out seem to be uh, roughly same 
Huh. I mean, so, even though the average is warming, these oscillations are not changing. Right. So maybe that simply means that forest cover is not changing. Um, oh. You know, because that is what uh, tells you how much extra gets absorbed in summer. Okay, okay. So, uh, but I mean, uh, in, in fact, the... Uh, how can one understand the size of that amplitude? I'm sure there's work, and I've been curious about it for some time now, but I've never got around to actually doing a, some simple calculations and order of magnitude estimates, etc. But I, my guess would be that the amplitude is not changing because it indicates that the forest cover is not changing significantly. I mean, which uh, there should be some data to support that point. Yes, and that's why I'm calling it a guess. Right, right, right. I understand. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, CVK. And I think we will close this for today. Thank you very much, Professor Shankar, again Thank for you. coming. Thank you all. It was a very fascinating and, yeah. of course, very important lecture. So on behalf of the Department of Physics and the Colloquium Committee, Thank all of you for coming and Shankar for this fascinating talk. Thank you Goodbye. very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.